Sound Radio. Hello. Hi, Paul. <laughs> well, it's Barry Bees again, and we've been following this um, the colony development since Easter, since bees started to forage in the spring, and uh, we've had a little honey harvest, and we've had some growth, and we've done some queen rearing. But to make it a bit more visual, I thought it'd be useful to explore the evolution of beekeeping just from the from the position of the bees, the bees' home, the hive. <clears throat> so what I have here are the frames that the bees live on in the hive. These were invented by a guy called Langstroth about 100 years ago. And until then, honeybees that were kept by beekeepers were kept in straw skeps. And this made it impossible to inspect the comb and in the event of harvesting honey, then it required the comb to be destroyed. But the, the advent of the wooden frame has actually enabled beekeepers to manage the health and the development of their colonies to harvest honey without destroying the, the home that the honeybees live in. So what I was just going to do is run through some of these, and they, they, um, they explain a lot in, in the story. So you've got a basic empty frame. This is made from a number of components and uh, we beekeepers nail them together. This is a frame that's been used uh, over a couple of times. I've taken the honey out now and again and it's an empty frame. So it's, it's basically just a square piece of, for our listeners at present, it's just a square piece of four pieces it's of wood box, together. It's a box, isn't it? A thin yeah. box. You've got uh, two sidebars, a top bar and a bottom bar about a foot wide, nine inches high, very light boxwood frame, sometimes made of cedar, but usually just uh, part, uh, pine wood. And these are nailed together and they've got another number of little features in them. They're critically important from the point of view of beekeeping because they control a number of parameters. When these are slotted into the frame, the, the f features in the frame make the distance between the wax equidistant and compliant with what's called the bee space. Because when these are in a frame, side by side, there's enough room between them for bees to work on both surfaces of the comb back to back. And so that's a critical dimension is the bee space. If we leave too much space, they'll build wild comb if we don't have enough space, then they'll neglect a face of the comb. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a precondition here that these frames equispace. In the next frame, I've fitted what's called a wax foundation. And this is a sheet of beeswax, which has been pressed into the hexagons that the bees will follow. We don't have to do this. The bees will naturally make this pattern themselves. But by presenting it in this form, it encourages the bees to make flat comb instead of wavy comb. It makes it much more manageable. And between the uh, it, embedded within this sheet of foundation wax are wires that give it a degree of strength. These two particular frames I've just showed you are what we call the national standard. It's the most mm. common size of frame. And, and the, how, how much is that? How, what size is that, roughly? The, the, well, these are both the same size, and we're talking about typically just over a foot wide and about nine inches deep. Right. Okay. There are other types of frames that beekeepers use for different reasons, but the national is a fairly common standard, and it means that all your component parts are interchangeable. All right, so you, you can swap bits of kit with other beekeepers. You, well, you can do. Um, you have to be careful because you can transfer pathogens with uh, used yeah. kit. You know, viruses reside within these. So I boil these in, um, in uh, soda every year to get rid of all traces of wax and all traces of any uh, pathogens and things like this. You don't just put them in your washing machine. And I don't just put them in the washing <laughs> machine. So the, the present Mrs Griffiths wouldn't like that. At no. All. no. Um, <clears throat> so this foundation, it's pre-pressed into a hexagon and as I say it's just to encourage the bees to use the flat wax it's natural beeswax which has been pressed out 
This is worker comb. So the found eight, the hexagons are a particular size, encouraging the queen to lay worker eggs in these cells. You can get a different shape, a size of hexagon for drone brood, so that when the queen lays drone eggs, or when the bees make drone comb, they follow the larger pattern. In the photographs I sent you, there are some photographs of bees. Oh, and we'll put these online yeah. shortly, yes. Well, there are photographs there of bees making wax. And wax is a nectar product. We've mentioned this before. It's not paraffin wax. Mm. Uh, it burns with an alcohol flame. It contains a lot of enzymes that are beneficial. And it takes bees about 10 times more energy to make wax than to make honey. And they exude little platelets of wax from glands on their abdomen. And then they manipulate that with their legs and their mandible and shape it into the shape of comb. So this particular frame I've got has just got foundation, a flat sheet of, um, of beeswax ready for the bees to uh, build and draw it out. <clears throat> the next frame I've pick up is a shallow frame so it's the same length about a foot long but only about five inches deep mm -hmm. and this frame would go into what we call supers they are shallow boxes above the brood nest right um, now this contains drawn comb it's an old piece of frame it contains drawn wax and it's really retrieved from my scrap box because in a few weeks time I'll be melting this down and retrieving the comb it's dark it's a, a dark color and the reason for that is that when the queen lays an egg into the cell the larva spins a cocoon in the cell prior to the, the cell being capped off she then metamorphoses from a larva pupa to an adult bee inside the comb and every time uh, a bee is raised in the comb there's a new skin applied and that gradually builds up this dark color it can attract infections and things like this so periodically we'll change the comb one or two little tiny interesting features on the comb is the way that the edge of the comb has been uh, cut back by the bees and the edges are thinned and uh, you see this quite commonly in, in a mm. number of um, frames where the wax is not fully um, bonded to the frame. And the reason for this is that the, the comb is the bee's larder where they keep their honey and their pollen stores. It's the nursery where they raise their brood. And it's also their internet. So in the dark, the bees will drum on this and if it's cut away the reverberations are much more clearly felt by other bees that press their antennae to the wax and so if a bee has found some forage that he wants to tell or she wants to tell the other members of the colony she'll come in and do a dance the waggle dance on this frame and the other bees will hear this and interpret it as a way of advising them where she's found this other forage so they cut away regions of the, of the frame to enable the cell to reverberate. There's one or two um, uh, old cells in this, but in the main, that's a typical example of a used comb. I've damaged it a bit in places. Mm. Now, there's another frame here, which is a deep broom frame, and it's got string on it, and it's been tied together with string. And this came from a colony in the army camp at Bottle Withen that we retrieved. And so we cut the old comb out and fitted it into these frames and then retained it with string until the bees had bonded it around the sections. And so in this frame, you can see there's dark comb and light comb. The dark comb is the original taken out of the, of the hut and the light comb is the fill-in that the bees have applied. Uh, so it's a bit of a history lesson, mm. this, 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 uh, this frame. It's still got a lot of old pollen and things like this in it, and it will be part of my uh, wax recovery program for this year. So that's... And then finally, I've got a small box here, which is for cut comb. So sometimes people like honey which is 
on the wax. Instead of being spun out of the frame, it stays on the wax. And here, this little box, we put a small piece of unsupported foundation in the middle and the bees build out the wax and then they'll fill it with honey. They only got halfway through building this out last year, so it's still dry. But I can then unhinge this piece of wood on the outside and I'm left with a block of cut comb honey. And that, that, what size is that then? That's, That's about four inches square. Four inches square. About it an looks inch, very an nice. Deep. If you're going to buy it. Yeah, you, well, a lot of beekeepers do sell this. Now, the honey fair, beekeepers honey fair, 13th yes. of September in Conway, you'll be able to buy a cut comb like this, uh, which is really very nice. Um, wax, of course, is edible. It's a nectar product. It's slightly chewy. It's got a good flavour. Contains all the antiseptic, antiviral, uh, antibiotic um, qualities of honey and um, adds to the enjoyment of honey, especially if you take chunks and put it on your porridge. It's wonderful. It's, it's good so to have. So that's a slightly yeah. unusual <coughs> piece of uh, frame. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned you've got uh, drone comb and we've got worker comb. When the bees are given drone foundation, they will build a larger hexagon. And the queen, when she, we, we use that for two purposes. One, we may want the colony to develop more male bees at certain mm. times of the year. But in our supers, which we're using for the honey harvest, a shallow frame with drone comb in it can hold more honey because the cells are larger. Right. The wax honey ratio is greater uh, is more beneficial in the case of drone comb where we're using drone comb to encourage the bees to make more drones and they don't need a lot of encouragement for that <laughs> um, <clears throat> the queen will lay an egg into the drone cell but she doesn't fertilize the egg so the egg is unfertilized and matures to become a male bee a drone um, so drones don't have fathers they have grandfathers and they carry half the chromosome and it is part of the genetic biodiversity that enables bees to adapt and the queen likes to sort of make sure there's not a great competition until it's a natural thing to happen isn't it well um Drones are essential for the for, mm. the for the propagation of the species. Obviously, they're the male um, component. They also perform quite a platonic and tranquilizing role within the colony. Their presence is observed to be one which passivates the colony and tranquilizes them. They don't actually contribute to the colony. They don't forage. They can't sting. And at the end of the year, they'll be evicted by the worker bees because they don't want to carry their, uh, uh, their, their, them over the winter while they'll only be consuming the stores that have been carefully put to one side to keep the colony in, in the winter. So around about September time, you can see them actually being pushed out of the colony by the worker bees. But um, in terms of uh, genetics and biodiversity, the, the the drones play a very significant role in equipping the colony with the range of different inherited environmental skills that they have. Mm. The queen mates with a number of drones, maybe 20 drones, yes. and mm. each one can only mate once. So that genetic um, package is taken by the queen into a reservoir which she will dose out to fertilise uh, female bees all her life and eventually they'll be used to produce new queens so when she lays her eggs and fertilizes them with the variety of sperm from these different uh, drones they inherit different characteristics some may come from colonies which are prolific honey gatherers some may be very hygienic some may be nuisance bees, they may be stingers <laughs> and followers. And so we try, when we select our 
standard queens for development to pick queens that portray the traits that we want going forward but you can't be sure of that because of the unpredictable drone component. But you need to spend your time to know your queens and you know your get colony. To know, get to know your queens. That's it. Yeah, it's yeah. very true. It's all about observation and, and things like this. So that's my little bit of um, visual today. Yes. Did you want me to mention anything about the experiences of the last couple of weeks? The I, I think so, yes, because you've been doing the honey... You've, your bees have been going on. You've you've had days away going off to nice places like Anglesey, Anglesey. And, and which is full of honey, absolutely full of honey, isn't it? Yeah, honey makers. Well, it's a very very interesting place for bees, Anglesey, and of course we've got some renowned uh, beekeepers there. Uh, Wally Shaw, OBE, he got his OBE for his services to beekeeping. He writes for the Welsh uh, Beekeeping Association. He's a mentor. Uh, an examiner and uh, I've been to his apiaries and they've got a very strong beekeeping association in Anglesey lots of forage lots of space um, uh, the, the horses that roam over um, Clandwin Island they encourage the generation of uh, a, a wide range of forage, different types of flowers different seasons and um, so it's, it's a, from my point of view, it's a very interesting visit to, to Anglesey and it's a lovely place to go. The, um, my own progress on bees over the last couple of weeks has um, it's been encouraging. I had this awful situation where I needed more queens. I'd lost a couple of queens in a couple of colonies. One had become a drone layer and I started a queen rearing exercise and I raised six, seven queens, six of them survived. And today I've got, I can account for four of them um, being mated and laying, so they've made it through the very risky process. Two colonies, two small mating nukes I've got, I'm still waiting for the signs that they've successfully mated, but I was very encouraged by that. And then I had. Do you, do you just as, a, as an interesting bit? Do you give them names or do you give them numbers to your queens so you can identify themselves, or is it just the hive queen? Well, there, there are tiny little um, discs you can buy, and you can press them onto the um, the thorax of the of the bee, of the queen, to identify her by number. Most. Well, some beekeepers, there is a protocol for colour coding bees dependent on different years. Mm. Last year was red. This year, I think, is orange. So there's a sequence of five colours that you would put a little spot of, um, like, like uh, uh, Tipex, only it's a coloured material, onto the back of the bee, so you can see her more obviously on the frame. Mm. It doesn't really work in my view because the beekeepers that know where the queen will be and she'll be moving towards the frames with the most recently laid eggs will spot her without her being marked. There is a slight risk that if you mark them it alters their pheromone yes. and they can then be rejected by the workers. Um, and the process of pinning her down and marking her is also <laughs> something that... I personally don't bother with. Um, mm. If you can, when you come to inspect your colonies, if you see eggs, then you know the queen has laid them within the last three days. And if the queen did die or she was squashed by the beekeeper or something, if there is eggs present in the colony, then after a, a short while, half an hour, maybe an hour, the colony becomes aware that it's lost its queen and they will adopt some of the latest um, eggs and early larva to develop them into replacement queens, either in a process of supersedure or emergency queen rearing, or in the case of a very healthy colony that wants to propagate, then they may raise a new queen in order to swarm and set up a new colony. And, and the other thing is that in all of this time, they've been producing lots of honey for you, haven't you? Well, I, um, I've got a big hive in the garden a bit nervous about it really because it's now got sort of six boxes on it. It's a big ugly tower 
of a, of a hive, but the bees are very productive. You can stand at the side of this hive and watch them flying out and flying in. It's like a, a mid-air dual carriageway. You know, these bees are just flying in from six in the morning till eight at night. And, 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 and as you said, when they go out, they take their little droplets of poo and drop it everywhere, don't they? They do, they do. <laughs> they splatter little bits of bee poo uh, uh, around. But so I went there the other evening, actually. Uh, I think it was last Monday evening. And um, I lifted the lid on this hive and they were quite placid, they were quite mild. I'd taken the smoke with me, I didn't really need it. But what I did find was that the top boxes were absolutely stuffed with honey. There were, I took away nearly three full supers of honey in my wheelbarrow. I could barely lift the wheelbarrow. So how much is that in kilos? Well, in... Yeah, or in pounds? In pounds, it would probably be about 70 pounds. That's a lot. Uh, yeah, and you can sell it at the market for six pound a pound. So, but I, most of mine gets snuffled away anyway, most of it. Do you uh, give it got, away like a lot of got, beekeepers? We've got a lot of people that uh, lay down markers for it. But I was really pleased with that. It, <laughs> it encouraged me, having had this difficult time with these queens, and I had this condition in one of my colonies in the, in the um, allotments at Bottlewithan called chronic bee paralysis virus, which in my view is a horrible illness. Um, it's not propagated, or it's not, it's not a virus carried by the varroa mite, which is our big mm. problem, parasitic mite. But the varroa mite does propagate it. Varroa acts as a dirty hypodermic in the colony, so it's it's for feeding off of different bees by cutting into their carapace and, and, and sucking the haemoglobins away. And in that process, it will deliver viruses from one bee to another in a much more prolific way than they would normally develop by bees rubbing shoulder mm. to shoulder. So um, although I didn't have a high mite count, the, um, uh, they had this chronic bee paralysis virus and I took a lot of parallel treatments. It's considered to be virtually incurable. Um, the only real cure being to shake all the bees out of the box, move the box away. Those that are fit enough will make it perhaps to other colonies and the others will die in the grass. I treated them for our, I fed them because it affects the, the foraging bees and reduces mm. their the strength as a colony. And in parallel, they requeen themselves. They'd set up two or three queen cells. I would have put in one of my new queens, but I didn't have to. And in parallel with um, feeding them, with applying varroa treatment, the colony requeening, I also shook the bees out. I shook them all out yes, into the corner of the last time, You dropped them out onto the, the floor. The healthy ones came back. And when I went there this week, there were no dead bees, and so I was really, 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 really. And if you're pleased. getting seventy pound of honey, that is is a lot of work by done by those bees. Oh yeah, I mean the average bee in its life makes about a quarter of a teaspoon. Yeah. So it's, it is a lot. There's thousands and thousands of miles. They work themselves to death. The little, the wings. And you exploit grudge. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, we only take the excess honey. We don't take it out of the blue no. chamber. We leave that to, for the bees. And then in the in the winter, as we approach winter, we'll be feeding them to make sure they've got enough stores to get through. Just a quick question. The the weather at present, good or bad for bees? We've asked it before. It's good, but it's good for bees. Good for it's bees. It's good for bees. It's this lovely, hot, still weather. There is a, a very rich honey flow on at the moment. There's loads of flowers. Look at the blackberry that's out. I mean, I'm always complaining about the lack of forage that we have here. We live in a mm. green desert, you know. There's, but at this moment, um, I was down the quarry path here in Kimmel Bay the other day, and it's just alive with um, with pollinated insects and sources of forage. And the blackberry is such a long season. And there's loads of other plants. We've just started the hebe coming out. And I put a number of photographs of of pollinated insects that were on the hebe uh, this 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 week. Uh, we've seen this succession of uh, of plants 
uh, through the, the year since Easter and before, and uh, they, they rise for a period, the bees forage on them and other pollinating insects forage on them, and then they complete their cycles and, and they're replaced. And now we've got a wide range of uh, summer flowers Bees tend not to forage on modern plants. You don't see them in roses or daffodils um, uh, or chrysanthemums and things, but you do see them on the old-fashioned plants, the daisy-type flowers. Yeah. You rarely see them on buttercups. A buttercup contains some sort of uh, a rhizome poison that's not very good for bees. But um, daisies, clover, um, and... Uh, the thing I advise gardeners to do is to look around and when you've got bees in your garden, make a note of the times when you haven't and look for the plants to plug those gaps. Uh, and they're increasingly important um, uh, gardens in the, uh, in the provision of forage. The other things that bees need are water. Uh, they, they take water into the colony and then they spread it on the top of the frame. Uh, so they'll spread it on here, beat their wings to evaporate it, and it acts as air conditioning. And they also use it to dilute the honey to feed to the larva. So they, they take little in. sources of water out for the bees and the insects. Yeah, and if you do though, you need to maintain it. It's not just have a, put a pot out one day and forget about it, it, because they will learn to go to that spot. So our bird tables, I've always got them topped up. Yeah just to make sure that the bees can get there. And you can get some good photographs of the bees landing, taking off and foraging for, for water on the, uh, on, the, on the tables. That's great. And you'll be back in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to it. We should have an interesting couple of weeks. We should I'm have hoping a... to bring you some more honey. Excellent some stuff. Runny honey this time. I love honey. Yeah. Whether it's runny or static, it's solid yeah. or honey. Yeah. Well, That's brilliant. I'll keep you in the frame. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's this is Sound Radio. Sound Radio.